whom we have worked very closely in, in the recent past and to whom we owe a great debt for bringing the engineering profession together at the beginning uh, of this year, which eventually led to uh, the task team that, that we had. And uh, to the members of your institute who volunteered their time and still volunteer their time to help us to deal with uh, a, a national crisis, which uh, hopefully, uh, with the ingenuity and hard work and the passion that we've seen uh, from your profession, we can say we're beginning to get to terms with. Although I don't want to claim that we've uh, overcome all of our difficulties at this point in time. Um, the response of your profession is also one in line with the call of the President to Mamina. Come forward, offer your uh, skills, assistance, and passion and energy uh, to the country so that we can deal with uh, the challenges on the one hand, but also seize the opportunities uh, that we have uh, in South Africa and uh, make South Africa a, a great country. Now, when addressing issues like the challenges and opportunities of the electricity and energy space, as you call it, uh, I have to confess I'm just a very badly trained pharmacist. Uh, we did a bit of physics and a bit of electricity, I mean, the chemistry. Uh, I pretended just now on the radio uh, in an interview of about 10 minutes to be, uh, somebody called me a practical engineer or an amateur engineer trying to represent you and saying all is reasonably well and in, in good hands, but hopefully uh, what I said is in accordance with the truth as well. So I start uh, program director on the basis that uh, the engineering profession is not an island. It doesn't operate in isolation of other professions. It doesn't operate in isolation from societal context in which we find ourselves. It doesn't operate in an institutional uh, isolation uh, as, as well. So the context in which we operate our country, our globe, uh, at this point in time, and the kind of uh, trends that are unfolding, both globally and in our own country, are not immaterial uh, to your profession, as the previous speakers have already uh, pointed out. Engineers should be, like any other profession, and indeed uh, any other uh, person in our own country, concerned with the issues that we have inherited from our past, but have uh, uh, as our challenges at the present, which is how do we produce inclusive growth? <coughs> so how does your profession contribute towards a more equitable distribution of the benefits of what we call GDP? Uh, throughout the globe today, the big concern, which I'm sure some of you are aware of, is not the fact that you have a 2%, 1%, or 10% growth uh, in, in one's economy, the big concern today with the slowing global economy is how are the benefits of that growth actually distributed amongst the citizens. And in a sense, engineers and professionals constitute part of the elite in society, both in South Africa and elsewhere in the world as well. And that elite has attracted a fair amount of distrust <coughs> among citizens uh, because elites tend to serve themselves. Elites tend to accumulate benefits for themselves. Elites tend to uh, ensure that institutions uh, on, on occasion are uh, maneuvered in a direction where uh, a few benefit from the patronage that those institutions have to actually offer. So one of the principal challenges in the globe is how does uh, not just the engineering profession but all of us generally begin to conceptualize a world and envision a world where there is uh, fairness, where there is equity, where human rights are enjoyed by all uh, the citizens of the globe, all eight, seven or eight billion of them. And in your particular case, we've met that challenge in South Africa uh, in the form of uh, electrification of households. Prior to 1994, we had what, 50% or more 
uh, households that were electrified. Today, somewhere between 75 and 85 percent uh, of the households have become dependent on electricity. Uh, whether it's the young people wanting to study, whether it's the male or the female cooking, invariably it's the female at the moment in this chauvinistic society that we still have. And I don't see enough women in this room, generally. Uh, and uh, the basics of life is dependent on whether electricity is available or not. And that's why load sharing becomes a big issue. It becomes a big issue because its lack of availability disrupts life. Uh, at a very fundamental level, let alone what it does to a smelting business, a manufacturing business, a gold, a coal mine, uh, and other uh, important entities in our economy as, as well. So inclusivity is, if you like, the big challenge of the 21st century as we go forward. The second is social justice. And that's in some ways linked with the concept of the just transition as well. How do we ensure that uh, both as a profession, but more importantly as a society, as our previous speaker pointed out, we have leaders who are not just interested in themselves, who are not driven by uh, individual greed, who are not there to extract patronage for their particular circles of friends and associates, but who are there to ensure that social justice is spread across society, meaning people have proper access to the right levels of education from the age of uh, one or two. Uh, we often think it only starts at six or seven. Uh, that we have uh, the right quality of health care provided for all citizens in the country, indeed all citizens of the globe. Thirdly, that there's a social security uh, net which is there to protect the most disadvantaged and uh, uh, those who are economically unable to look after themselves. And there's a broader concept of just lack of discrimination, <laughs> lack of racism, uh, lack of sexism, and all the other negative isms that contaminate human society uh, from, from time to time. And the just transition is an important component as we move forward. Uh, towards the broader concept of social justice and inclusivity as, as well. And if the engineering profession is to begin to talk about uh, the challenges and opportunities in the 21st century, I mean, that's, that's the kind of broader context I would suggest, and we can debate that when I finish, that we need to locate ourselves in. Because a narrow conception of our task, a narrow conception of the role of the profession can end up with ourselves being in a state of mind which says, where's my next tender coming from? Where's my next business opportunity coming from? Uh, how do I grow my business versus somebody else's business? How do I uh, ensure that I make the right, uh, if you like, to use a South Africanism, the right connection so that I can outmatch somebody else uh, in terms of access to business? And I think some of the nodding heads in the audience suggest that I'm communicating the right message at this point in time. So <clears throat> the, the broader view in the context of the kind of leadership that uh, Mrs. Setswane talked about a, a few minutes ago uh, is, uh, I think, a crucial requirement of leaders in the engineering profession as it is for leaders uh, in other professions and other segments of society as well. Having looked at those broad trends, if you like, we need to also maybe concern ourselves with where the globe is at the moment uh, in terms of the mega trends that are operating at this point in time uh, across the world. So there are those who uh, have analyzed the more uh, recent trends in both politics and society and culture and are saying that we are entering a period where there's a significant competition between advocates of ultra-nationalism on the one hand and democracy on the other hand. So there are those who believe that uh, nation uh, or nationalism in the narrow sense of the word is the way to go. And it's beginning to infect some of our thinking in the South African context as well, where only we matter, only South Africans must be 
employed in a particular environment. Once you talk about uh, South Africans operating overseas, that, that is not, un that's not important. But if you talk about a foreigner coming here to offer some technical assistance, as we saw in the recent past, there's a big hoo-ha. <coughs> Why are we bringing foreigners here? But then, what shall, uh, should other countries that rely on South African expertise in Philippines, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, chase South Africans away from there as well. Because we are foreigners in that particular environment as well. But the more important point uh, in this regard is that ultranationalism undermines democracy. Ultranationalism uh, begins to uh, advantage just a few uh, within a particular society and uh, both the economy becomes undemocratic because it's narrower in terms of those who have access to the benefits of an economy, uh, but it also undermines institutions uh, of democracy as well, as we've seen in the recent past you know, in our own context. But secondly, ultranationalism leads to a vicious form of right-wing populism. And uh, you see that happening in many parts of Europe today, leading to phenomena uh, like Brexit, uh, as we see in, in the context of the UK, and uh, resulting in uh, protectionism uh, of one sort or another as far as trade goes. I know some of you must be thinking, now what the hell has this got to do with engineers? But that's the broader context in which engineers are operating. And uh, leadership, uh, and uh, the kind of active role that engineers are required to play is quite dependent on our interpretation uh, of these trends and how they actually impact upon us, both as South Africans, but more generally uh, as, as well. The equally, um, on the economic front, what we are finding is that uh, across the globe and in many countries, there's high levels of concentration uh, in, in economy, and as engineers you would know uh, that this takes a particular form as far as what is called big tech is concerned. So today, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are on Facebook and uh, those sorts of digital mechanisms, but all of your data is not available to you, it's available to Facebook. It's available for sale uh, to Cambridge Analytica and others. It's available to analyze what you like and what you don't like, and what your preferences are. It's also available for political manipulation, as we saw in the 2016 American elections as well. And we are heading towards uh, elections in the South African context as, as well. So these forms of concentration, the dominance of multinational companies and multinational tech companies, uh, is also an area of concern because it begins to impact on the sovereignty uh, of different countries and the kind of economic and political trajectories that they can actually uh, follow in their own right. It's in this context that I think we need to look at uh, the whole question of uh, other forms of technological challenges, like the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the role of artificial intelligence, both in your industry uh, and more generally as well. But we often romanticize this, and uh, the flip side of that coin is what is the social and economic impact of uh, these new technologies? So yes, there will be a potentially a productivity increase, although countries like the UK in the recent past, despite uh, a few years of digitization and so on, have shown no remarkable growth in their economic productivity up to this point in time. But the big concern across the globe is how do you train, uh, let me see, the average age here is about 40 in this room, or thereabouts. So even 40 year olds, how do you retrain them to fit in with the new digitized economy? They're a little bit more agile than 60 year olds, I suppose, but uh, nonetheless, uh, 60 years of age is still a working age in most parts of the world. And the kind of adaptation that is going to be required and retraining that's going to be required is quite acute. It's also this phenomenon of powerlessness 
this phenomenon of being marginalized, this phenomenon of distrust between elites and citizens, and this lack of uh, direction and sense of where, where is the world going and where is my future, and where is my children's future going to be, that then creates a toxic, toxic political mixture, which can be capitalized upon uh, by all forms of populism as well. So the future of jobs, uh, our president was the co-chair of a commission set up by the International Labour <coughs> Organization together with the Prime Minister of Sweden. Uh, I haven't read the report, but hopefully, has anybody here read it? On the future, on the future of jobs. But it, it, it raises an important question about what, what, are, what will jobs look like in 10 and 15 years' time? And uh, how do we begin to prepare societies, including uh, professions like your own, for that kind of future. Because I'm sure the kind of electrical engineering that you uh, acquired in your training period and through your vast experience is gonna be probably a little bit out of sync, to put it mildly, with the new demands that, that are beginning to emerge in your own profession as well. And the question is, how does that kind of adaptation uh, actually occur, and how quickly can it occur as, as, as well? There's uh, obviously the, the question of the just transition that I'm sure you are far more expert at than I am, but uh, I think what that demands of us, particularly in our kind of context, is um, what happens to the 600 to 800 people that work at each power station when a 55-year-old power station closes down, or when individual units within a power station like Indrina begins to close down. What's happening to thousands of people dependent on a coal mine in the proximity of the power station? And what kind of future can we say <coughs> is designed for them as the uh, coal mining industry comes under pressure, as uh, it is coming under pressure at, at the moment? And I'm sure you know uh, <coughs> that uh, whilst we have huge resources as far as coal is concerned, there is a massive challenge in getting investment into coal mines and indeed into coal-powered stations as well. Uh, the World Bank and other, ins other international institutions have actually said clean energy but or nothing else. The two financial institutions in South Africa have taken a similar stance as well, both in relation to the mining industry but also in relation to coal-powered plants. Uh, technology as far as renewables and alternate forms of energy is still dominated and in the hands of the Western or more advanced countries. And so in the past, we used to talk about a digital divide. Today, we're gonna to talk about a technology divide because uh, those who have access to the technology and have invested in R&D uh, because of the resources that they have, both human and uh, monetary, uh, are not quite willing to share those resources uh, on a free basis. We tried this uh, in a couple of years ago when the climate, Green Climate Fund and so on was being set up uh, through the climate talks, through the IMF and through the World Bank. Uh, but the Western or developed countries were quite clear. Uh, there's no free donations uh, as far as this kind of technology is actually uh, concerned. So amongst the challenges that you face is, as I said, to sum up uh, at this point, one, uh, the global trends. Second, engineering in the context of society and global trends more generally. Uh, the, the whole question of inclusivity and the new dynamics that are required of leaders, both in the political field, but more importantly, in the different disciplines in, in society as, as well. And uh, if we don't uh, look at those, those sorts of challenges carefully, then as some of you said, uh, Time will pass us by, and we'll find that we are behind the curve as opposed to being as leaders ahead of the curve in terms of what is actually uh, required. Uh, more specifically, in, in, in our own context, <coughs> uh, you referred to Eskom particularly. I think our challenges there, and I'm sure this will come up in the Q&A, so I'll be brief, is to ensure that in the post-state capture period, we restore all of the basic systems 
uh, and processes in SBIM to some level of normality, because every crucial process in SBIM was disrupted for one reason or another. Whether it is coal procurement, and we're still not out of the woods as far as that is concerned, uh, there are still quality issues if the quantity issues have uh, been largely resolved. Secondly, um, <coughs> the quality of maintenance and the kind of uh, attention that various contractors have given, the kind of tasks that they have been assigned uh, at the maintenance level. Thirdly, the depletion of skills uh, in the right places and of the right skills, uh, good managers, as I said earlier on, and some of you pointed that out as well, uh, who are honest and who were going to speak the truth, were either displaced or marginalized. And that's where the whole question comes, uh, which is our current narrative, what happens to good, uh, honest, black professionals uh, in institutions like uh, ESCOM in terms of the more recent past uh, that uh, we've been through. And essentially, if you're honest, you were, you were on the sidelines, or you were kicked out, uh, or you were uh, fearful, because fear was an important uh, factor in making sure that uh, the senior management was able to control that was actually required to be controlled. So the issue of skills and the deployment of skills uh, is absolutely crucial as well. We have learned from elsewhere in the world, and I've been repeating this almost every day, in the different fora that I speak in, uh, that procurement uh, is the crucial area of state capture. Whether it is procurement of coal, procurement of diesel, procurement of burning oil, procurement of parts, procurement of services, procurement of consultants, and I can go on with that, with that list. So what we learned at an anti-corruption conference in Copenhagen <coughs> is this wonderful slogan which says, procurement is the name, but corruption is the game. <laughs> right. Procurement is the name, corruption is the game. And so globally, the procurement area is the vulnerable area as far as institutions are, are concerned. And uh, those, those are areas that need to be put right, let alone governance. Uh, in some instances, during the height of state capture, I mean, boards and word commons were meeting at midnight figuratively speaking, through teleconferences to sign off on a billion rand contract, 600 million rands or 700 million rands of advanced payments. But today, uh, in some contexts, it says, uh, they some say it takes nine months to 18 months to sign a similar kind of coal contract. So what's going on? It's something that needs require, that, that requires serious uh, repair, if, if you like. But all of this is also, I think, crystallized in the financial challenges that ESCOM faces. I think you know the numbers, I'm not going to bore you with that. If you compare the numbers of 10 years ago <coughs> to the current period, you have uh, 32,000 staff producing the same amount of energy, 44, 45,000 megawatts, uh, 10 years ago, and you have 48,000 people producing the same amount of energy today. So what are those extra people doing? in terms of uh, uh, cost-effective delivery of, of electricity. If you take uh, the price of coal, I think it's gone up three times. Uh, price of maintenance, one up four, four or five times. So everything has been multiplied by three to five times more in just a 10-year period. And, and that is what, including uh, the kind of cost overruns that we do be able to see there, has caused the financial crisis that we find ourselves in. And in the radio interview I was doing just now, the uh, question is, what do you do with 420 billion rounds of debt? That's, that's uh, more debt than any company in South Africa has. And how do you actually uh, manage that in, in the current environment? And it's that factor, together with the lack of transparency, lack of accountability, lack of uh, clear sight of where costs are actually allocated and debt is allocated that led the president and government to make the announcement that uh, ESCOM should be split into generation, transmission, and distribution. And that as a first step, we need to get the transmission component established 
as a 100% owned entity uh, within Gestalt Holdings itself. There's, of course, uh, <coughs> uh, a fight back element, as you know, uh, amongst those who engaged in malfeasance, which says that all of this is designed to displace people from jobs. It's not true. Uh, secondly, the other narrative is that this is all about privatization and the president selling stuff to his brother-in-law, amongst others. I'm sure your brother-in-law might get involved at some stage if uh, the narrative goes that far. That's also not true. This is about restructuring an entity and positioning it so that it can serve <coughs> South Africa for the next uh, four, five, six decades as we go through the energy transition uh, and the structural transition that we actually need to undertake uh, as, as, a, as a country. So in that process, <coughs> there's a broad idea of where we want to go. The details are now currently being worked upon, <coughs> as is the process of consultation uh, with trade unions. So there's three levels of consultation that we've established. One is at a ministerial level. Uh, we've met two of the three recognized unions in Eskom. The third one we'll meet uh, early next week. Uh, the second is at a board level, so that the board also interacts with the trade unions and has uh, an open channel of communication. And the third is at a management level where it comes to labor relations and other related issues as well. We also have NEDLAC as a structure in South Africa, so NEDLAC uh, has had a presentation on some of this and we will engage in dialogue uh, as far as uh, some of these changes are concerned. But these changes are not ones that you can take 10 years over, because there's a sense of urgency that we need to apply to uh, our own situation as well in order to get into the future. So the, 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 the position at ESCOM is one where we want to stabilize the institution as much as possible across all of the different fronts that I've mentioned, and many that I haven't mentioned, firstly. Secondly, prepare the ground uh, for its own structural changes. Uh, thirdly, make sure that it becomes financially sustainable. And fourthly, while we're doing all of that, prepare for the energy transition and the kind of changes uh, that ESCOM will be required to adapt to. Uh, some of which is demanded by uh, the climate change commitments that we've made, some of which is demanded by the technology changes, both within the current environment, but the future environment of renewables as well. There are some imponderables on which I think people like yourselves uh, need to come in and make a contribution. Where do you get extra base load from? Uh, how, what's the latest battery technology or storage technology? Uh, because we must not romanticize uh, renewables. They don't have the entire answer at this point in time, as I'm sure you know much better than I do. Uh, and there are some structural constraints as, as we sit together at this point in time. So those are the ESCOM related issues. But as far as the profession uh, is concerned, and I come back to, to yourself, I think uh, the, the issues of providing a clear vision to the profession in the social and political context in which we find ourselves is absolutely crucial so that uh, a leading body like your own can actually uh, ensure that the profession is able itself to uh, undergo the transition and uh, uh, cope with the kind of changes that any transition like this brings uh, uh, with it uh, as, as well. So a clear vision, which is aligned to the country's vision, I think is absolutely crucial from your point of view. Secondly, to provide the kind of ethical leadership that was indicated earlier on, because we do need to repair our souls. Our souls have been badly destroyed. Greed and avarice and shortcuts that we've been taking as a country, uh, the need to acquire. And this is not just a, a public institution challenge. It's a, challenge that the private sector and the public sector need to confront equally. Because there's two sides to this. You don't tango alone, except if you're looking in a mirror and practicing the tango. <laughs> but I think you'll fail at that as well. So, so what is the national culture that we want to see in South Africa as the business culture in South Africa five years from now, 10 years from now? And what kind of ethical principles 
<coughs> and values should it actually be based 